welcome all those of you who are here. Um, hello, welcome everyone to our online discussion, our online debate on uh, feminist exploration of COVID-19. I am Paula villa Braslavsky. I am professor of sociology and gender studies at the Institute for Sociology at the University of Munich in Germany. And I am going to chair this event. I'm super happy and um, it's an honor to do so. We as a network are very proud and uh, glad to host this event with the support of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, European Union and the Gunda Werner Institute. Um, so you are all and we are all attending the inaugural event, the first event of what we think will be a series, uh, the series of feminist exploration. exploration. And uh, we do have some plans for further online discussions in the coming weeks, so please stay tuned. We, the initiators of this series, are a network in the making, combining the work of feminist scholars, activists, and advocates to collectively fight against what we consider a backlash of the far or through the far right. And we are trying to build and create strong a strong bond of feminist and academic solidarity all over Europe and beyond, um, globally, internationally, and uh, hope to learn from each other in um, how to deal with the contemporary you know, political situations. Um, some technical remarks before we get started. Um, please note that this event will be recorded. We would like to say um, some special thanks to our technical support team, Harold and Anna and others who made this possible, who are supporting us in running uh, this also technically, and who created this secure platform for our conversation on very short notice. So thank you very much. The recorded video will be available uh, soon after our event on the YouTube channel of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. So you could, you know, watch it afterwards, spread the word, invite others to um, watch it. I would also like to mention that for the debate, you are most welcome as participants to post questions, to ask uh, questions, to formulate comments, uh, um, whatever you think is um, um, suitable, uh, please use the Q&A function for debate and for the question for the panelists. The Q&A, um, I at least see it at the bottom of the right, at the far right of the of the screen. So please enter your comments and your questions there. There's a back office team taking notes and clustering questions and passing them on. So please uh, make use of that. For any further questions or comments regarding the network, the foundation, more general questions, also perhaps technical support, please use the chat so that we can distinguish both channels. Thank you so much. So as to what we are actually going to debate today and what we are going to do. In this session today, we uh, will talk about social inequalities, about the distribution of labor, wealth, and especially about who perhaps is most affected by the current crisis, um, the COVID corona crisis. Um, and the idea is to, in very brief time, but still talk about what genuinely feminist perspectives are uh, regarding this crisis we are living through and um, which issues from a, pers a feminist perspective may not have been addressed or not sufficiently addressed so far, perhaps in policy, in politics, but also in the academic um, realm. And um, we want to contribute to the conversation by really stressing feminist perspectives and asking what feminist perspectives may be and look like in this context. And we have three really wonderful, um, excellent speakers. Um, thank you so much for uh, engaging and being with us. I'd very briefly introduce our three panelists um, and then um, give them space to talk. Um, they're joining us from three time zones, so it's really amazing what uh, social media enables us to do, which is really a positive thing. First is uh, Leita Hong Fincher. She's a journalist and a scholar 
reporting and working, especially on China. She is the author of one book titled Betraying Big Brother, The Feminist Awaking in China, and another one titled Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China. Welcome, Leita. The second speaker is Montserrat Sago. She's a professor and currently director of the Center for Research in Women's Studies at the University of Costa Rica. She's also um, an activist for many, many years, perhaps even decades, um, working especially uh, in um, topics on violence against women, on so-called feminicidios or femicidios, especially in Central America. Montserrat, a very well, welcome to you. And we have Olive Uva Maria. Um, she's a feminist and pan-Africanist with over 10 years of experience in policy and advocacy, uh, working especially for women, women's rights in the Great Lakes region. She is uh, joining us from Kigali in Rwanda. A very warm welcome to you, Olive, and thank you for being with us. Um, thank you. So, as I said, um, our topic is broadly feminist responses, questions, issues within the Corona crisis. And the panelists are asked to talk only five minutes each. And we are totally aware this is way, way too little time for the important issues. But in order to have a debate with each other and with the audience, we will try to be very brief. Um, so. The three um, that would be later then Montserrat and then Olive will have each five minutes to briefly um, give their input. And after that, we will have a very brief discussion among the three panelists. And in the time you can post and um, your comments and your questions as participants, and we will then address these questions from the audience and open the discussion. And I will do a very, very brief wrap up at the end. And we have then five a minute's time. So um, I am very honored and uh, looking forward um, to chair this and uh, would like to uh, ask Leita for her input. Hi, thank you so much for um, that introduction, Paula, and thank you so much as well to the Heinrich Bo Foundation for inviting me to, to join in this really important discussion. I think it's absolutely critically needed. And please, Paula, tell me when my five minutes is up. So um, there's so much ground to cover, but we're at a very, very dangerous time in world history with uh, so many things. I mean, the coronavirus pandemic has already killed uh, about 450,000 people around the world. It will continue to kill people in the United States where I am right now. The death toll is rapidly approaching 120,000 people. So the coronavirus alone has already killed more Americans than were killed in all of World War I. I mean, that's just a staggering number of deaths. Now, what I wanna emphasize is that this global public health crisis, which is uh, almost unprecedented, certainly the first in a hundred years, is, I believe, inextricably linked to also the rise of strongman authoritarianism around the world. If you look at the countries with the highest death tolls, uh, the US, um, Brazil, uh, the UK, um, these countries and countries where the coronavirus is spreading most rapidly, that also includes, in addition to, you know, the US, UK, Brazil, also Russia, um, I'm looking at this updated, also India. All of those countries are led by strongman authoritarian rulers, or in the case of the US, for example, Trump, who is a wannabe authoritarian who has um, be widely documented as having, you know, trying to cozy up to these dictators around the world. And so in the U.S., um, but you could see these patterns around the world, but in the U.S., we are facing an enormous assault on our democratic freedoms. Um, and there is no question that there would have been hundreds of thousands of lives saved 
had we had a different kind of leadership in all of these different countries. And to me, that indicates that, first of all, if we had had more intersectional feminism to begin with, we wouldn't have these strongman dictators. I mean, if uh, one of the things that I'm sure you've all uh, looked into in your research, but is the close correlation between these kinds of uh, authoritarian um, male leaders and the assault on women's rights. So these strongman rulers tend to be very misogynistic. In all of these countries, we've also seen an enormous assault in many ways on feminism and on women's rights. So I also believe that the solution to so many of our pressing problems, the global public health problem of the coronavirus pandemic, um, if you just look at the countries that have successfully dealt with the coronavirus, those countries such as Taiwan, um, which is right across, right off the Chinese East Coast, um, and of course the virus originated in China, and when it originated, it was covered up by um, the strongman authoritarian there, President Xi Jinping. It was covered up and whistleblowers, the whistleblower doctors were silenced and punished. Now, if China had had a different approach, you know, then the virus wouldn't have spread as much. Same thing in the United States. It's the same kinds of patterns we see in so many countries around the world um, where the governments, these authoritarian leaning or authoritarian governments are covering up, um, they're denying science, um, and they're even in, in some cases punishing whistleblowers. Um, and so they're allowing the virus to spread needlessly and kill more people. So I think um, one of the things that gives me hope, and I do think, uh, I hope we talk more about it, is that we have seen in the United States a massive wave of protests, Black Lives Matter protests um, against anti-Black racism. And I think this is really critical. This, it's, it's spreading around the world in a lot of countries as well. That gives me a lot of hope. Um, but I also hope that in these protests that are urgently needed against systemic racism, that we also raise the issues of intersectional feminism, that we also highlight um, the damage done to women and girls. Um, and I probably might, <laughs> I'll just um, wrap it up there. I mean, I am a, an expert on China, and so I focus particularly on, um, in my recent book, Betraying Big Brother, on this new feminist movement in China that I believe is posing an unprecedented challenge to the um, authoritarian rule of the Chinese Communist Party. But I also believe that feminism, intersectional feminism that brings in um, racism, systemic racism, you know, transphobia, LGBTQ uh, phobia, um, all of intersectional feminism uh, women's rights activism is absolutely critical to combating this uh, pandemic as well. Thank you. Ada, thank you so much. Uh, brava. So um, perfect on time, five minutes, and uh, there is a lot to discuss from there. We'll do this after all the um, inputs are given, and I uh, would love to ask now Montserrat for her input. There you go. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Paula, I really appreciate the opportunity to share uh, with you all uh, some thoughts. Um, first, I would like to say that this crisis has exposed some faces of capitalism that are sometimes hidden, uh, are sometimes hidden behind colonial, racist, sexist, or even behind the efficiency-driven discourses associated with the ideologies that seek to reduce the size of the state. Um, uh, one of the faces that uh, has been revealed is what I call the lethal face of capitalism. Um, this has always been a, a key characteristic of capitalism uh, because capitalism has some techniques of extreme devaluation of life that produces bodies vulnerable to marginalization, exploitation, and even death. In Central America, we know a lot about that in terms of femicide and feminicide. 
But this little face of capitalism is now, uh, we can see it full blown. And uh, um, I think it is because uh, there is always more alarm and awareness of death and of vulnerability uh, when the victims are closer to the centers of power. Uh, wh what do I have to say about this? Uh, it is different when people are dying in the Mediterranean Sea because they are Africans or Central Americans going up to the United States when you have a lot of dead people in New York, in Madrid, or in Milan. Uh, I think that causes much more alarm. And actually, you can see uh, explicitly this uh, lethal phase of capitalism, as I said, when the uh, uh, death is closer to the uh, centers of power. Um, I also think that uh, the full scope of capital neoliberalism is being revealed. Um, uh, we can see now that not all people are affected the same. The ability to isolate, to work from home, uh, to homeschool children, etc. Now we can see how different this is and how particularly some women, some poor women, some women from the poorest sectors are being the most affected. Uh, the crisis has also revealed decades of neglect on public health uh, systems. It has revealed the private, privatization of those systems, the precarization of work, the erosion of labor rights, and, and also the dismantling of public health. Um, in fact, uh, those are some of the factors that have increased the number of deaths in many countries. Another issue is that the lockdown measures uh, also reveal a homogenizing policy that doesn't take into account inequalities and different type of vulnerability. It is a policy of surveillance and micromanagement of bodies, assuming the existence of a, of a population with equal opportunities, life chances, and access to resources. Uh, such policy will have only increased precariousness, hunger, violence against women and children, and even increase the risk of contagion unless it is introduced alongside redistributive measures and gender measures. And those measures have not been implemented anywhere in the world, or at least they have been implemented only in a few countries. Um, so, um, from my point of view, uh, the social and economic aftershocks from COVID-19 pandemic could set women back, women and women's rights back by decades. Uh, this crisis is also giving governments new justifications for the implementation of repressive measures and new forms of political and social coercion. Let me give you an example from Central America. The government of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala are reviving the repressive repertoire of the past and imposing states of exception. They have a lot to take from the past, and they are using it completely. Uh, uh, there is also a radicalization of apparatus of biopolitical control, uh, no longer in the name of national security, as it was in the past in Central America, but now in the name of public policy uh, or public health, actually. So, um, the last uh, seconds that I have, I'm going to say that in addition to uncovering the lethal phases of capitalism, we can see the potential of neoliberal recipes to set off humanitarian disasters. We can see clearly how neoliberal recipes from the past and the, the ones that are being imposed now are basically uh, uh, weapons to start off humanitarian disasters. Uh, I'm going to leave it right now because my five minutes are off and I will discuss more a little, a little more later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Montserrat, to you as well. Perfectly on time. We very much appreciate that. And without much further ado, I'm very um, happy to now uh, pass the word and the floor over to Olive. And I'll be strict on your time, so you have five minutes as well. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I have bad internet, and I think, um, um, you know, it's always important to acknowledge that when you don't have access to internet, it's also 
a problem for participation. And I think it's, some, it's something that I wanted to, to share here. Um, but also thank you for inviting me and sharing uh, my views. Um, I am speaking as, as, as a person living in Rwanda. Um, I know what's happening across many parts of Africa, but I'm not speaking on behalf of the continent. So I wanted to, to say that. Um, and secondly, I think a lot of ground has already been covered by the, the previous speakers. Um, what I say, I think for me, the first thing that um, as a feminist and an activist is that the, the crisis has really shown us, you know, the, 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 the level of inequalities in the world. Um, you know, just looking at the ability for you to stay at home and survive. Um, a lot of people have had to dig into their resources and their savings to be able to survive. Um, so it's really important to understand that the different measures that different governments have really put in place are dependent upon, you know, how much money you have, where you live uh, geographically, whether you live in the city, live in, in, in a very remote poor area and you cannot be able to access um, the radio or even access information. Um, obviously, it's dependent upon race, um, gender, so many um, other aspects. Um, but looking back at, at my country and many parts of, of the Great Lakes is that the biggest impact has been on women and girls. Today, as I speak yesterday, um, there were more than 4,000 cases of girls that were uh, are pregnant, reported to be pregnant in Kenya um, over a course of three months. And that is because a lot of young people, young women, girls don't have access to information. They used to have access to, to sanitary pads, to condoms, to contraception um, as part of their school systems. But because they are now at home, they cannot be able to access these kinds of um, these kinds of services. And then going back, looking at how much um, there has been a lot of crisis in terms of the health sector, um, many governments are, are overwhelmed with how much they can be able to respond. Um, a lot of donors have been able to provide funding to governments, but it's important to see money is going. A lot of them are actually uh, beefing up data. For example, in DRC in the Congo, uh, numbers are being beefed up to, to look like there are cases of, um, of, of COVID um, so that they can be able to get funding. So it's important to understand to what extent this really affects um, women and girls. And um, we also have a lot of uh, marginalized groups that are being left out of government response. Um, for example, I live nearby um, a lot of female sex workers and they're unable to continue doing their work because simply uh, they don't have the resources, the capacities, you know, the, the support within them to continue doing their work. We have a lot of, um, you know, intimate partner violence that has increased, particularly rape um, uh, and sexual assault of young girls um, from family members. This is something that we are seeing every day and coupling to the fact that a lot of them don't have access to a, a free hotline, um, they don't have access, they don't know how to report. Uh, you'll find that the governments are saying, wash your hands, sanitize, but they are forgetting to say, you know, you can be able, there is a domestic violence, there is a shelter where you can be able to access these services. So a lot of them are confined in spaces where they are unable to be able to do much. And, and this for me as a feminist, um, I'm seeing how the government is putting in place measures. To an extent, we are seeing austerity measures where the government is reducing programs and funding allocated to the most marginalized groups so that they can be able to respond to COVID. Um, and these affects mostly women and girls and marginalized groups that are already forgotten, that are already not part of that. And then um, we're also seeing a lot of uh, power dynamics, particularly between um, the so-called North, um, Western countries and, and the South, or you know what they call developing countries. I don't like such terms. Um, but here, of course, this is not something new, but we are seeing um, a lot of people using the really speak out around you know the inequalities, the racial discrimination that has always been there and that has made even worse as a result of that. And then finally, we are seeing closing of civic space. 
Um, most of the governments have all these task team, national task teams. They are sitting behind closed doors and they are deciding where the money is being allocated without consulting civil society, without consulting women's movements. And this has really been made uh, worse. But on the other hand, we are seeing positive positiveness, particularly around collective action and solidarity of feminist movements using digital platforms. We are seeing a lot of activism really happening, and I'm happy about that. Um, and finally, we are seeing a lot of redefining what we understand by, um, you know, liberal neoliberalism, but also where funding needs to be allocated. We are seeing women's movements saying, look, if you are not funding uh, women on the ground, you cannot be able to provide, you cannot be able to find long lasting solutions. So it's important that as much as there has been closing of spaces, there has been a lot of resources and, and facilitating, you know, feminists to be able to organize and speak out. Issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Olive. This was also super on time and super rich. I'm sure there's very much, uh, again, to discuss there. And to give everyone um, the opportunity to think about and post questions, comments uh, to all the panelists and uh, for, for the debate, um, I would like to kind of ask back to our panelists, thank you again for your input. Um, so uh, Montserrat, Leita, Olive, um, and Olive ended on this note, actually. I would like to ask you um, concretely, perhaps out of your experience, the regions you know about or the networks you are yourself involved with, um, what are the kind of um, important feminist activist responses you are seeing, witnessing right now to this um, very multifaceted crisis that, as Montserrat said, exposes so crass the, the lethal fate uh, of um, contemporary capitalism. So um, I'm, I don't know if to, to talk about hope, but yeah, what kind of activism and um, practices do you see or do you know of um, that, as you said later, may be a good example for intersectional feminist responses or for, um, yeah, a, a feminist or, yeah, feminist responses to the crisis concretely? What do you know of? What are, what are good examples? Or, yeah. Are you asking me? <laughs> For example, I start? Later, but I'm sure. asking all three of you, so yeah. go ahead, Leita. Well, let, let me just start by saying, I mean, uh, because I've written, you know, my research is on contemporary China. I've written two books about uh, women and feminism in China. Let me just start with China. So um, all of them, you know, that that what you talked about, it, the increasing uh, intimate partner violence in coronavirus, you definitely see that in China. Well, you see it around the world, but but just speaking about China, um, this was an area where feminist activists in China who deal with domestic violence or intimate partner violence said that they were getting a, a huge spike in pleas for help from women, largely women, I mean, also some uh, men, but but largely women and girls who were, um, who were confined to the home and being beaten by, you know, their intimate partner, their their husband, um, in many cases, um, and so there were feminist activists in different cities in China who were responding to this by actually going outside and putting up notices, um, just saying if you're a victim of domestic violence, you can actually call these numbers. Um, and, and also online, there were, um, even though China is a country that has incredibly aggressive, the most aggressive uh, form of internet censorship and surveillance in the entire world, you still manage to see um, some viral hashtags around the issue of domestic violence or intimate violence, even on Chinese social media, which is extremely heavily censored. Um, and But then I might also add to, how the Chinese feminist movement has also become globalized in a way because there are uh, Chinese feminists who are now in exile in the US, um, either they're self-exiled or they're studying or they're recently graduated and working in the US. Um, some of them have also seized on the momentum of the Black Lives Matter protests and not only are they advocating for feminism, but they're also expressing solidarity 
with um, the Black Lives Matter movement and going around in the US like to Chinatowns in uh, Queens and in Manhattan, for example, and going to Chinese owned businesses um, to uh, ask them to put up signs, uh, say Chinese for Black Lives Matter. And so the Chinese activists themselves are, uh, are impressively intersectional and they it sort of gives you a, it gives me hope as well because they see you know where is the momentum in terms of um social movements in terms of organizing how can we express solidarity with other marginalized groups um you know how can we come together and link our oppressions um and and try to bring about change in that way L let me just stop there um Okay, so I'm unmuted. Uh, thank you so much, Leita. Uh, that's uh, great. So, who would want to go next? Olive, Montserrat, Montserrat, are you? Yeah. Sure, sure. I'll I'll go next. Thank um, you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I will say that uh, also in besides revealing, you know, the lethal face of capitalism, um, the the crisis has revealed other important things that are now becoming part of a conversation, which I think advances, you know. Uh, uh, or has the possibility for the advancement of women's rights. First, um, the lockdown measures have created a widespread debate about the nature of the domestic space. Um, feminists have been talking about this for centuries, but now with the large percentage of the population confined to their homes, conversations about the un unequal distribution of reproductive work uh, and domestic tasks family violence against women uh, uh, that has entered the mainstream conversation. I think that's important. Uh, in that sense, the pandemic has helped to undermine the conservative notion of the family and the home as spaces of peace, security and harmony. And, uh, and I think it's, it's good that it has exposed the persistent uh, sexual division of labor and the centrality of women uh, in life sustaining care work. Um, I think uh, this discovery, let's call it that way, and the visibility on the issue can become the first step initiating a process of change. Second, um, the renewed appreciation of care work and other neglected jobs is another unintended consequence of the crisis. Um, so this crisis could be an opportunity to reclaim the importance of the objects and resources uh, with use value. Uh, in addition, it could be an opportunity to increase our understanding of the importance of the work that allows for social reproduction and of the people who perform this kind of work. And finally, uh, this crisis has generated renewed demands for a welfare state. And I think that is positive. I mean, if we cannot eliminate the state at this point in history, it is better to have a welfare state, a state that is concerned with justice instead of an authoritarian state. So in that sense, uh, the discussions about the need for a state that takes care of the commons, uh, the, that implements measures of protection for the entire population, and that becomes an agent of redistribute, redistribute, sorry, redistributive justice and also gender justice. I think it has become part of the conversation and that is important for the advancements of, of feminist propositions and feminist movements. Thank you so much, Montserrat. Uh, I think there are also some questions already in the Q and A regarding some of these issues. You know, the kind of um, state, the authoritarian state, and the response, etc. We'll go into that in a bit. But um, um, Olive, I'd appreciate if you could share. You know the experiences, insights, um, the response regarding feminist responses you know of, which might be also kind of positive or important or nuanced. Yeah, um, thank you. I think I think one of the examples I'm going to give is around um, a, a huge campaign that is being driven by feminists on the continent. Really more accountable and tech um, dignified response. So when we are talking about responding to COVID, to what extent are we taking into consideration the dignity of women, girls, and all people of all genders, but also to what extent are we centering the needs 
of the most uh, vulnerable um, because a lot of governments, for example, my country here in Rwanda, the response has been one of the best. Um, however, it has been one of the worst in addressing the most marginalized groups, which is very interesting that um, at the end of the day, the, the response has been great, but it's really not taking into consideration uh, the needs of the most vulnerable. Um, one other example is also, for example, uh, the, the abortion uh, and reproductive health uh, movement on the continent um, that is now pushing for uh, you know, more response, more better services that are geared towards uh, women and girls. And for example, self, uh, self, uh, self, self-induced abortion, or uh, really, how do we ensure that women within their homes they are accessing, you know, the right medication to be able to to access abortion and be uh, and be healthy. So it's it's one of the other examples that is really happening. Uh, and then in Nigeria. Um, the feminists are really using online platforms to demand accountability from the police, uh, particularly, I'm sure you've heard of cases of, of young act activists who have been sexually assaulted and have been uh, killed. But here it's really the intensifying the need for uh, government to be more responsive and also to be more, uh, uh, to be more recognizant of, of the issues that women and girls are facing. Um, and then finally, for me, something that I've noticed that has been uh, interesting is, is the rekindled spirit and connection between Pan-Africanism and uh, women's rights. So we are seeing really a Pan-African movement that wants to draw uh, lessons and resources from the feminist movement when it comes to organizing and influencing the government. So we've created quite an interesting uh, movement that really looks at uh, you know, how do we collectively look at the responses that African governments are providing, but how do we also center this response towards uh, women's rights? So I think for me, that has been very um, interesting. Thank you. Yes, very interesting indeed. Thank you so much. Um, so after this uh, very rich inputs and these many, many issues we could talk about, I'd uh, like to now make space, um, taking up some of the issues, um, make some space for the questions and comments that are coming in through the Q&A. Um, and I think then one that um, might fit well at this moment is that um, someone asked, um, directly Montserrat, but I think you could maybe all address this in a way or the other. Uh, Montserrat, you at some moment in your input said that there um, are social and economic aftershocks um, that come from the COVID-19 um, situation and crisis and that these could set back with the women's mo movements or equality, uh, gender equality achievements back by decades. And if I may add, that's uh, a concern voiced by many uh, colleagues and activists and uh, myself partly, for example, from within the German context, where we have the same anxiety and, and, and um, concern about um, will this be a kind of rollback, a setback? Um, so the question that's uh, given here is, could you explain a bit more about how you see this? What precise um, kind of setback you were talking of? And if the others want to join in, please do so. You have to turn on your microphone, Montserrat, please. Thanks. Sorry. Um, I think the situation is in dispute, of course. Uh, what I'm saying is there is a risk that this could happen. Uh, of course, the uh, feminist movement is not quiet, you know, anywhere in the world. Uh, the feminist movement is active uh, with reduced possibilities in some countries because of the uh, lockdown measures, of course. But, you know, but still, what I'm trying to say is that we have seen already some some signs uh, in terms of reproductive and sexual rights. We have seen uh, uh, many situations in many countries that uh, tells us that that might be an issue that could be extremely affected, you know, that women could be affected for the decades to come uh, in terms of violence against women. Also, um, we have seen that the lockdown measures have increased you know violence and the response from the states has been uh, really terrible uh, i have not seen a gender policy to protect women uh, as part of the uh, 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 
uh, lockdown measures, there was nothing, you know, in relation to how to protect, you know, women or children. Um, the fact that also we have seen uh, millions of jobs that have been lost, uh, most of them have affected, you know, women, uh, women who were in the most vulnerable, you know, sectors uh, have lost their jobs. And, and I don't see also policies uh, being implemented in terms of protecting these women. The, uh, the countries that um, were able to implement some kind of uh, basic rent, you know, for the people so that they could survive, you know, the lockdown measures didn't uh, place women uh, at the center of the policy. Uh, so basically, most of the or most of this money uh, uh, went to the men. And uh, they didn't take into consideration that in many countries, women are heads of households. Uh, women were supporting entire families. I mean, there was the gender bias, you know, uh, 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 favoring men. So uh, I think also that many governments are using, you know, the crisis uh, uh, as an excuse uh, to pass uh, legislation and measures that are uh, uh, very, uh, uh, that that could have you know impacts for women and uh, uh it's like a strong machinery you know that i put in together using uh the uh, uh the crisis as an excuse thank you so much would the other panelists want to comment on the on the same issue or you don't have to but it's uh, an opportunity maybe you know the also later you talk about authoritarian responses but i think all of you wanted to comment as well yes um i wanted to talk about you know the, the 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 threat to the women's rights movement we are seeing it every day for example we are seeing government putting in place family centered approaches and programs that family harmony and, um, and and little to do with women really being at the center of it. And I think that is a very, very dangerous approach. Um, the other thing we are also seeing is that we are, we are seeing more and more cases coming out. Honestly, um, it's been completely overwhelming that um, a lot of governments, my government included, are not willing to integrate um, violence against women and girls as part of the response, yet there is a huge cry out that, you know, this is threatening women to continue, you know, living their lives. So I think it's really important. And then, thirdly, um, when we talked about the lockdown approach, I think uh, we are seeing women being relegated to their traditional gender roles. And this is something that um, if you see, whether it's in the global UN spaces, whether it's national wise, this is a, a, a policy or this is an agenda that a lot of you know governments, a lot of uh, are advancing. And we are seeing more, more um, uh, voice from conservative and religious groups that are really um, centering, you know, lockdown as a, as, as as family friendly. Yet, you know, this is completely uh, uh, terrible, and this is threatening, you know, women's rights. So that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think the issue of of the gender roles and and the the exclusion from labor market, etc., is a really important issue. Also, for example, in Germany and you know Western European countries, as well as of course the violence. So I think there's really a kind of generalized issue here for sure. Later, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, no, I I really agree with both uh, Olive and Montserrat. I think that this is a very dangerous time. Um, there, there's no question that there are governments who are exploiting the coronavirus pandemic to um, increase their authoritarian oppression um, uh, overall. And specifically, well, you could take any number of examples. Um, let's look at uh, China. Um, so China has, uh, I've written extensively about how the Chinese government, particularly under President Xi Jinping, has been pushing very subservient roles for women, um, pushing them into marriage um, and having children. Um, it's a huge reversal from the past. It's very complicated, so I don't want to get into it too much. Um, but the pandemic is a very convenient excuse uh, for the government to just say, okay, everybody just needs to stay at home. You're going to be at safe. You're going to be safe at home. And of course, women are, then have to play these very traditional gender roles, which is exactly in line with what 
the Chinese government's overall goals are anyway. Um, and in fact, they've passed new restrictions on getting divorces recently in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so it's going to be much more difficult for women to get a divorce now. Um, and But do you see this in so many other countries? I mean, Hungary, for example, one of the first things that Orban did um, when he kind of claimed more uh, dictatorial powers was to make, you know, anti-trans or anti-LGBTQ issues like the, the, one of the most uh, pressing uh, issues for his government, which of course it's not at all, but there is this very dangerous anti-feminist, anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ um, ideology um, that is inextricably linked to this kind of strongman authoritarianism. Um, and and you see that absolutely with uh, governments exploiting these stay at home orders and I could keep going on, but I'll just stop there. Thank you so much later to all of you for these really important um, kind of yeah insights or the stressing um, these very specific issues. There is another very specific question, which we haven't addressed at all, but is coming up in the Q and A. And I don't want to kind of, you know, surprise you, but I, maybe I will. Um, the, the question is, do you have any thoughts on climate, um, issues and sustainability and climate change and energy transition? There are several questions, um, from participants addressing this in terms of um, how could we, for example, someone's asking, how could we integrate gender justice and uh, ecological issues um, within, you know, the responses and the dealing with and a feminist perspective on the ongoing crisis now? Um, I know of um, activists and also kind of theoretical conceptualizations um, that, for example, see a link in terms of care, a caring response, uh, uh, an ethics of care that would address the vulnerability as generated and uh, made visible through the crisis and extend this not only you know, to humans, but also to um, the environment, nature in general. That might be one linkage, I don't know, but I'd be uh, happy to hear your thoughts if you have any, uh, because this came up in the Q&A later, you already have. Sure, I mean, I'd, I'd, li I'd like to point to, for example, the example of Greta Thunberg. Who the you know this young girl who's Swedish who's the you know very famous climate activist. Um, but it, what's interesting is that there is when you look at the anti climate. Uh, later, stop, stop, stop. Your mic went off. I don't know why. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. There you are. Thank you. Uh, so let me just um, say that. If you look at those uh, far right wing um, authoritarian activists or governments or foundations or whatever sources of money that are fighting climate science, they're science denialist. That movement is very misogynistic at the same time. And if you look at uh, the example of uh, Greta Thunberg, um, who is this well-known Swedish girl who's a, the climate uh, change activist. She herself has been the target of a lot of misogyny, misogynistic attacks. And so it is. this is what I mean when I say we need intersectional feminism. And by intersectionality, I mean, there are all of these different related causes and issues. Our, our battle against all different kinds of injustice and uh, you know the denialism about climate change is also one of those extremely important related causes that and and it's not sufficiently explored the degree to which misogyny is used to deny um, the the activists, the women and girls who are climate activists, um, but all of the forces that undermine the science around climate change are also deeply misogynistic. And so all of it, uh, we, we need a very uh, broad, um, inclusive approach that is intersectionally feminist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other thoughts on the issue? Uh, there are more questions and we have very little minutes left, but um, Montserrat, do you want to I come back? I just want to say something yeah. uh, 
very briefly. I think that there is a lot of this that the uh, uh, the uh, the way of accumulation, you know, the capitalist accumulate, you know, the, the climate crisis is also related, you know, to the production of this coronavirus. So that in that sense, many people are saying, in, you know, economy, that we need to change the patterns of production, that we need to change the patterns of accumulation, you know, uh, that we have seen so far. I think that is very important that this discussion uh, is present uh, nowadays, but I also have seen signs uh, that uh, the people who are making the most important decisions are not, you know, do not really care, you know, about this discussion. You have seen already the practice of bailing out, you know, huge companies uh, and corporations that don't have anything to do with a green economy. Those are the ones who right now, you know, are winning, you know, uh, some of the resources that are being, you know, put there. So I think um, th there is the issue. Uh, the issue is there. Uh, we need to support the people who are, you know, promoting this kind of approaches. We need to fight, you know, a uh, big always have. I also think, I also agree with, uh, with Leta that it has also to do with a, a very masculinist, you know, approach of uh, creating supposedly things that are of value, but really are not, <laughs> you know, they, they don't help us, you know, to reproduce life. Um, but so I think it's, it's a debate and we need to really, you know, uh, keep the finger on, you know, so that uh, uh, at least the discussion continues. Thank you. Um, I think there's time for one more issue, which if we take very little minutes for that, but uh, we could uh, talk about because it's also come up several times. Someone has asked um, very specifically if you have noted kind of particular patterns or yeah, forms of femicide during lockdown and across various stages and levels of lockdown also as these have eased maybe or kind of you know this new now exit strategies as they are at least called in germany so a very concrete question i know we've talked about gendered and uh, sexualized and gender related violence um but this uh, question i think goes to a kind of you know particular patterns and empirical observations could you comment on that any any of you jump in yeah um i think I'll speak quickly around, uh, yeah, I think that absolutely that's one of the things that we are observing every day. Um, a lot of stories that are coming in the news talking about um, the killing of women and girls. Um, and I think for me, uh, the, the the biggest uh, lesson or what we are observing mostly is that mass Um, you know, we are talking about a lot of men who are breadwinners or not even breadwinners, but by, you know, title of uh, heads of their household, they are really, because there's no income coming in as much as it, should, it is, so there is more sort of quote and quote justification um, for, for the anger and, and the frustration that men have. And, and, and I think that's something that is not being addressed. What is being addressed mostly is looking at how do we support um, families with food packages, you know, whoever is hungry. Little looking at to what extent, um, you know, uh, uh, is the law contributing to more forms of, of negative masculinity and, and, and femicide. And so we are seeing a lot of that. And, and I think another thing that is highly, highly underreported is sexual violence, particularly sexual violence within intimate partners. Um, because this is a very serious problem that uh, most most police uh, officers are not able to address, and also a lot of countries uh, don't have policies and understanding of um, intimate partner violence, particularly sexual violence within the home that does not include children. So um, I think we we are looking at a different form of um, femicide and, and and killing of women that has really heightened, and unfortunately. Uh, less reporting um, of, of these issues as, as we used to see, again, because of the breakdown of, of existing services where they are. Thank you. Any other comments on the issue? Montserrat, you have to turn on again. Oh, thank you. I just want to say something very briefly. Uh, I don't really think Costa Rica is, you know, an example that could be generalized, but I just want to say this. 
Uh, in Costa Rica, uh, more women have died victims of femicide during these three or four months than the people who have died from COVID. Um, with only 12 people have died from Costa Rica, uh, but we have already 15 women who have been killed uh, as victims of femicide. Could I just jump in as well and say that um... I think this is a critically important issue. There are countries like China where we have no, there's no transparency. We have no idea how many women uh, are victims of feminicide. We, we, we also don't know really what the actual death toll is from coronavirus in China. Um, so, uh, but getting back to the issue of violence against women and girls, this is an incredibly serious problem in China about which there is extremely little transparency, very little ability to get at the actual numbers. But there's no question that femicide is happening along with, I mean, the government has tacitly admitted that there has been a surge in intimate partner violence. Um, most of the victims of that have been women and girls. Um, and so, uh, but I'd also like to make the point about, um, you know, in the US, I've been very heartened to see a massive outpouring of protests um, for Black Lives Matter against racist police violence. But even in those protests, you see, you, you don't see as much emphasis placed on the lives of black women and girls. And so um, that, that that's also a problem. And definitely there are uh, black women who are talking about how we need to, to show that police violence is not just targeting uh, black men and boys, it's also targeting black women and girls. And, um, and so, I, I mean, these are just, these are global dynamics as well. Women and girls tend to, to suffer a lot or maybe even disproportionately, but then when you see the symbol, symbols, who is li lifted up in the social movements, that tends to be the men who are getting the attention uh, and the women who are doing the work um, are, are made invisible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, I taking from there in term, maybe in, in intending a kind of wrap up also, you know, what we should keep on thinking about and um, voicing and networking through is probably um, the rather specific way of how vulnerabilities and the biopolitical regime um, of capitalism is gendered and sexualized in a specific way because of course it's not generally man or woman but as you yourself have stressed it's a specific version of what is sometimes maybe called toxic masculinity. Um, and as you know, you later said, you know, the strong man authoritarianism or Montserrat also said, you know, this kind of um, uh, masculinist approach or Olive also stressed, you know, this kind of specifically gendered and sexualized forms of violence. So obviously um, this crisis, um, reveals and perhaps even tragically intensifies a very specific uh, way of how, um, yeah, as I said, the biopolitics of contemporary capitalism are gendered and sexualized. Then again, not in a kind of general male or female way, way but specific masculinity um, patterns um, that uh, go along with specific uh, authoritarian responses and policies are stressed. And perhaps other masculinities are also kind of attacked um, and, and, um, and are made vulnerable. And uh, of course, women can be in this sense very masculinist as well. So it's really uh, important to look at the specificities there in order to understand how the um, perhaps universal condition of vulnerability uh, that we share as humans is at the same time very specifically unequally distributed and made relevant along gendered and sexualized lines uh, globally and also very much in relation to a region as Montserrat again said you know uh, the 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 tragic cynicism and the obscenity of, you know, how much a life in Milan uh, or Frankfurt counts when compared to other regions or the Mediterranean, uh, etc. So, um, again, also the racialization 
uh, also of these gendered and sexualized um, biopolitics would be very important and um, yeah, there's, I think, so much to to take into consideration there. And as later you said, it has to be probably an intersectional, a critical intersectional approach um, that might be the best response. In this sense and in this light, uh, I do hope that we will all keep networking and intensify our um, debates, our networking, our um, conversations, our also uh, critical discussions among each other. Time's over um, for now. Um, as I said, I hope we will keep this going. Um, please stay tuned, watch out for the next series of uh, feminist inquiries to come for feminist conversation. And I again want to give a really huge thank you to Leita, Olive and Montserrat for joining us on your different time zones and from your busy schedules. Again, a, hard, a very um, big thank you to the Heinrich Böll Foundation, to Harald and Anna, to Zara, uh, Sarah and uh, Zora, um, who set up this and helped us. It would have been impossible without you. And um, that was it. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. So Bye. Much. Have a good night. <laughs> and a good day. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you for all of you for participating.